I'm Tim Ewald. Uh, obviously, I work at Cognitect on the Datomic team. I'm also the uh, tech lead for Pedestal. Um, before the conference, Alice, Alex asked us to send some answers to questions by way of an introduction, and one of them was favorite function. Um, so I threw that out there. I tossed in what I thought was an interesting fact that I've used to start previous keynotes, which is, does anyone here know what is special about St. John's Wood tube stop in London? It is the only one whose name does not include a letter from the word mackerel. <laughs> so if you get nothing else out of this talk, that's a fantastic thing to drop at dinner parties and you know what have you. <laughs> All right, so, um, so I have worked uh, with Rich for the last couple of years, which has been um, you know, really super enjoyable for me. I've learned a ton of stuff from him. One of the things that I've learned is that you can get a lot of mileage out of going back a ways in time and picking up a tool that most people have forgotten about. So I brought mine right here. Hold it higher. Okay, hold it higher, so everyone can see. This is a beautiful circa 1910 Bucks Brothers cast steel chisel. The reason I brought it was I needed an example for this talk, uh, which is programming with hand tools. So we often uh, say, you know, we should really use the right tool for the right job. And it's absolutely true. It's an interesting uh, expression, though. First, I don't know as I've ever heard anyone apply it to a tool that they didn't like. <laughs> right? So it's worth really thinking about what tools we do use. I spend a lot of time thinking about tools in, in two veins. Software is one, and the other is woodworking. So. I'm 44 years old, and one of the things I have learned about myself in the last couple years is that I can't not be building things. So, you know, I am at my happiest when I'm writing software or building furniture. Um, I am at my, I can't say unhappiest, it's not really fair exactly. One of the toughest times for me is when my family goes away on vacation, which is fantastic for my wife, because she needs to get out of the house to relax, and after a little while starts to drive me bonkers, because I can't just lie by a pool or at the beach and read books or what have you. I gotta make stuff. Um, I work primarily by hand. Um, there's a bunch of reasons for that in the you know, woodworking space. Big ones are it's a lot less noisy, it's a lot less dusty. Um, woodworking dust is a known carcinogen and you have to have pretty sophisticated equipment to keep it out of your space and out of your lungs. Um, and it avoids problems with physics. Uh, a lot of power tools involve rotating a blade very quickly, like 10, 20,000 RPM. And then taking a piece of wood and pushing it into that blade tangential to the axis of rotation. That means that there's a front edge of that blade that's pulling the wood in and pushing it down, and then the back edge of that blade is pushing it up and back towards you at potentially a super high rate of speed. So you can inadvertently push wood into a spinning blade and have it come back at you at 50 or 60 miles an hour. Um, so it just doesn't seem like a good idea to me. Now, a lot of people hear me say, I build furniture primarily by hand, and they think, man, that must be a lot of work and really complex, and it's not. There's three things you need to understand, and I'm gonna teach them all to you right here, right? First, you need to understand the material, right? Wood is a thing that has known structure, known properties that we can reason about. The most important one that really differentiates from closure is that wood is mutable. That turns out to be really, really important. A tree is basically a mutable stack of cones. I never thought about it this, this way before until, until I was learning how to read grain in a, piece of, uh, in a piece of wood, right? When you think about how a tree grows, it gets bigger, but it doesn't get bigger at an even rate all the way up. It's not a cylinder, right? It tapers at the top. It's a series of really long, skinny cones. And so when you cut a board, out of a pile of cones, it's a conic section, right? That's why when you see boards that have those grain patterns, which we call cathedrals, right, because they're not clean enough to be called parabolas, that's why those show up there, right? A board is basically a conic section of a tree. In general, wood is stronger along its length than along its width, right? And it expands along its width and not along its length. It expands due to humidity, right? So the wetter it is, the more it expands, the drier it is, the more it contracts. So here's a picture. I, I'm not an awesome photographer. Um, these were photos I shot in my shop. Um, 
But this is an attempt to show you the conic section. So this is the bottom of the board. It's as if we sliced the tree and then laid it back like this. And I don't know if you can tell in the photo, there are some rings up here, the annular rings of growth, right? That's the bottom of the cone. And then we see the cathedrals up on the board up there, right, up here. That's the cones going up the tree, right? And if you look right here at these very light lines, they're going that way, okay? So that's the structure that you deal with, right? That's the known structure. And everything that you do in hand tool woodworking is about taking a beveled blade like this, and this is really the only tool. All other tools are variations of this, as we'll see, and attacking this wood in some way, right? So check this out. I just got this. Look how thin it is. No wires. It's <laughs> awesome. So using a blade with a piece of wood is really easy, right? If you go this way, you slice something off it. If you go this way, across, it works like a knife and slices the grain. If you go in this way from the edge, it splits the piece of wood. If you go in this way, straight down, it chops a hole out of it. And if you angle it this way and drag it across, it switches from slicing to scraping. That's it, right? It's all about how you take this blade, what angle you hold it at, which direction you're coming from, that's all you need to know, right? Every single hand woodworking tool works like that. Here's the other thing you need to know. This is a beautiful door, and it's not mine. I didn't have a door convenient to photograph, so I had to borrow one. Um, you've all seen doors like this everywhere through your whole life. They're shaped like this for a reason. They're shaped this way because the wood is stronger in these dimensions, and it stays more rigid. And inside each of these pieces is a groove that allows this panel to float. It's not actually fastened in. And the reason it has to float is because wood expands and contracts in its width. Right? So there's a reason that every door um, that's actually made of solid wood that you've ever seen is built like this. Right? So we talked about what a tree is built like on the inside, right? And how we take advantage or, or you know, work around the fact that we get strength the long way right, not the narrow way across the width, and then we have to deal with big panels that uh, are going to expand and contract. Make sense? All right, so that's all you need to know about wood. Now, you need to know about tools, and as I said, there's really only one. There is a beveled blade, and every single woodworking tool, every single hand woodworking tool, um, really just amounts to this, right? It's a blade of some sort. And we'll take a look at a couple in a second. There is a gateway skill to working with this, these fundamental tools, and that is sharpening, right? A blade, a, a, an edge, right? These are edge tools. An edge is made by getting two planes to intersect at, you know, a true edge, not a, a single line, right? Not something rounded over. Um, sharpening is a really daunting thing when you start. When I was researching getting more into hand tools, uh, there's a, like a zillion things on the internet about how you could sharpen and different technologies and tools. Um, the important thing is to just try it. It turns out not to be that difficult. This is a, a really old chisel that I bought um, at a vintage tool sale. It, it uh, got reground to uh, clean up the blade that was there. Whoever had sharpened it previously didn't have it straight. It probably took, um, I don't know, five, 10 minutes to get it sharp enough to shave the arm hair off my arm, which is usually where I stop in terms of sharpening something. And uh, it, you know, once it starts to get dull, it takes, uh, I don't know, maybe a minute to 90 seconds to touch it up again, and then every now and then you have to go back and do the original thing again. Um, so it, it, you know, it seems like this really challenging task. It's, it's, it turns out not to be in practice. All right, so let's look at a bunch of tools. So um, these are all chisels, right? This is the one I just have right there. These are just other chisels that work exactly the same way. This one's kind of special. This is known as a pig sticker. That's for really uh, wailing on the edge of a board and driving a hole really deep into it. So it's got to have this really beefy blade and this, uh, and this big uh, tang up here that stops the wood from splitting. This is my grandfather's uh, vintage um, Stanley number four bench plane. Uh, bench planes, you've, I'm sure, seen pictures of. And really, it's just a big chisel in there. This bit right here is the blade. It's a giant chisel. You'd never be able to hold it at a stable angle and push it along. So a plane is really just uh, a chisel holder, 
right? With handles. That's it. These are um, joinery planes. Joinery planes have different shaped blades, like this one, or one right there. And what they do is have all kinds of arms and attachment that hold the blade at right angles to some other piece of the plane. So they allow you to put grooves into things or you know, cut things square to other things. So there's a handful of them to do um, various things. This tool is called a scraper. Right? Scrapers are a really fine way to work wood, so it takes off just a little. It was the example of if you tipped a blade up like this and went this way. So that tool up there is just a holder for a piece of metal angled like that. This is a card scraper, which is just a piece of metal that you hold with your hands. Okay. Even a drill. This is a crummy photo, I apologize. But even a drill, see this little edge right here, the shiny bit? That's a little beveled blade, and there's one on the other side. Right? So that drill has a lead screw. You start to crank it around with an old bit and brace. The lead screw goes in, and those two blades start to cut around in a circle to slice through the wood. OK? All right. I love this picture. You know what it is? Yeah, it's a seven-point ripsaw, 26 inches long. And if you were to count up along the length of the blade, every one of these is a tooth. There's 140 of them. They're just tiny little chisels. It's all just chisels, all, all the way down, OK? All right, so we, we understand about the wood. We understand about the tool. We know the structure of the tree. We know it's really all just chisels. Now we need an environment, OK? The environment in hand woodworking is really important. And it, it, with a lot of machine tool work, I mean, people don't um, build these things quite the same way. You need a workbench. And a workbench, when you work by hand, is a three-dimensional thing to hold pieces of wood in place. The fundamental difference between woodworking by hand and woodworking with a machine is when you're using a machine, you bring the wood to the machine, right? And move the wood across the machine. When you're working by hand, you bring the tool to where the wood is and move it across the wood. So you need to hold the wood still, OK? My workbench is based on this design, roughly, which is uh, this. Etching is from a book by Peter Nicholson. It was uh, originally published in the mid-1700s. Um, why go back that far for a design? Well, because if you work with hand tools and you want to find real expert opinions on how to do it, nothing beats the guys who didn't have any alternative. Right? Those guys knew what they were doing. They supported their families, working six days a week, 12 hours a day, making stuff. So you got to look at what they did and like, really pay attention to it. So this is a picture of my workbench down in my shop. It looks basically the same. It's got this big apron on the front with a whole bunch of holes in it. It's got these metal things we'll see more of in a second. And it's got this crazy uh, hooky thing over here on the left. Um, that thing's called a crochet. Crochet is just the French word for hooky thing. <laughs> this is just a cool action shot. All right, so you need to be able to hold pieces of wood in place to work on them. So here's a board. Getting, uh, I mean, it's already flat, but the, these are, I got to admit, these are posed photographs, right? <laughs> so if you were flattening this board, you'd lay it down flat, you'd run the plane tra traversing across it. Um, there's actually no vices on this bench. There's, there's nothing but physics to hold things in place. So there's a stop up here inserted in a couple holes that hold it going that way. You can't really see it here, but there's a groove in the bench, and there's a piece dropped in behind it that stops it from sliding that way. Um, so I prefer to work where possible, just having stuff braced against other things. The blade is going to exert a lot of pressure on the wood, so it's not going to come back at you, right? So you just need something else to stop it from sliding, and you're good. So we can work the faces of boards. We can work the edges of boards. And this shows what the hooky thing is for, OK? It's uh, sometimes also called a jam cleat. And it basically lets you slide a board in and hold it in place. These metal things are called holdfasts. These were the tools that people used before there were vices. The holdfast, uh, they're about nine inches long. They're made out of, these are made out of a kind of iron uh, or a steel wire, actually. Um, traditionally, they would be forged. And what the holdfast does is it slides into a hole in the bench that's fairly deep, say two and a half inches. And then you hold it in place, and you take a wooden mallet, and you smash the end of it. And it flexes enough that it shoves the shaft into the hole and wedges it there. Those will hold tight enough that I can lift my bench with them. 
Well, I mean, I can lift half my bench. The bench is heavy enough, I'd need someone else to lift the other half. <laughs> you release them by smacking the back of them, that jars the thing in the hole and it pops out. And the reason that the front of the bench is covered with holes is it's super convenient for using holdfasts. Okay? So this is working uh, an edge of a board to get it at right angles and smooth and straight. If we turn a board on end and push it into the cleat and smack a holdfast in there, then we can work the end of it. While there isn't a vise actually built onto the bench, there is one that goes on the other end. Uh, this is known as a Moxon vise, named for Joseph Moxon, who wrote another woodworking book back in the 1800s. Uh, it's designed to hold a pretty wide panel so that you can work the end of it, typically if you are cutting dovetails with a saw along these lines. The vise is actually just clamped onto the bench using holdfasts. So the system kind of builds on itself. Here's one last example of uh, working on a piece. In this case, this is a, a back panel for a, um, for a bookcase that I've been working on for ages. Uh, and it's using the same two holdfasts that were holding the vise. And they allow me to clamp it down right along the edge and then take that plane right there, which has a fence on the side that butts up against the slip, run the plane down and cut this uh, rabbit into the side. Right? And that allows me to overlap panels. So this workbench is um, pretty solid, pretty stable and substantial. Um, it was built with this set of tools. Right? I build, as I say, primarily by hand. So a bunch of saws, a bunch of planes, some drills, some chisels, and you're done. To be fair, um, in, the, in the name of full disclosure, there were, however, two automated tools that I use. I said at the beginning I work primarily with hand tools. Um, I use a bandsaw up there. Right? I use the bandsaw primarily for rip cuts. That's cuts along the length of long pieces of wood. Um, I do those by hand sometimes, but it's pretty grueling. Um, so, you know, that one's just uh, the, and me admitting that I'm 44 years old. Um, I also use a drill press. Um, that's just me admitting that I really hate it drilling a hole that's not square. Right? It's just super irritating. So, um, so those were the two power tools that I use, right? Um, neither of them has that physics property of pushing wood into a blade at the wrong angle, right? They, they, they don't violate my primary safety concerns. They do, uh, at least the bandsaw does generate a fair amount of dust, so it actually lives in my garage. So I, I actually only have a bandsaw, um, I live in New Hampshire, so I have a bandsaw seven months of the year um, <laughs> that only gets used, you know, when the big doors open. All right. So you might wonder, you know, why do I put myself um, through this? Like, why would I want to work this way? Um, the first is that I have really come to appreciate simple tools. My friend Craig would say that's because I am a simple tool. <laughs> and he could be right. <laughs> All right. I, I, I just find, I, this is such an odd thing to say at a tech conference, especially with something as, as you know, uh, something like Clojure that I think is really moving us forward is the more I spend time with computers, the more I um, have to spend other time with things that are distinctly not computers. Um, and you know, I, I love this quote. Um, have any of you ever seen the, the Woodwright shop on PBS? Yeah, with Roy Underhills, the guy who does that. He, he, he's a hand tool woodworker, like just all hand tools. He started the, um, the carpentry and uh, cabinet making uh, program at Colonial Williamsburg. I mean, he has this great quote, the ancestral simplicity of the blade is a great thing. And it is really true. There's something super fundamental about it as a human being. I also really like working by hand because I get a phenomenal amount of precision and control with my tools, far more than I could get with the power tools that I can afford and have space for. You can get super high quality power tools that are extremely expensive and super precise, but if you don't have the budget or space or inclination for that, you can do phenomenally well with hand tools. This is a shaving taken with a smoothing plane, which is the last step in finishing wood. It leaves a finish that doesn't need sanding before applying whatever it is you want to apply to it. I don't know if you can really tell in this photo, but this is thin enough that you can see the pencil through it. It's on the order of a thousandth of an inch. With a sharp enough blade, that's a you know, pretty, uh, pretty reasonable tolerance. You can work at the thousandth, two thousandth of an inch kind of, um, kind of place. 
So super difficult to do um, with a machine. Here's another example. This is more from the control perspective. So I'm working on this um, bookcase for my wife. And uh, this is a piece of molding that goes around the top. I actually brought a little chunk of it here. And uh, this molding was designed by me saying, what do you think we should put on here for a piece of molding? <laughs> and her drawing a little picture. So we took the picture away and cut it out and stuck it on the end of a piece of wood and then made the molding from there. Um, it's made with these two wooden planes. I don't know if you could tell in the photo, one of them's concave, one of them's convex. They're called hollow and round planes. The hollow one cuts the rounded bit. The rounded one cuts the hollowed bit, right? And then these are two uh, cabinet scrapers, just pieces of metal with graduated sizes of concave and convex circles, which you can scrape down those surfaces to get them super smooth. Now, one of the challenges making molding is when you're done, you have to cut it at an angle. And this, you can see kind of in the back there, that's actually cut on a bevel because you're going to put it on a corner. And you need to be able to make that super precise, both in terms of length and just in terms of getting the angle right, 45 degrees. So here's a tool I built to do that. One of the things with simple tools is a lot of times when you first see them, you're like, what is that? Right? Core logic's like that. <laughs> um, and, and then when you see them in use, you're like, oh, OK, I get it. So you look at this and go, what? It's some kind of box, and it's got some angled stuff and a dowel, and there's this weird wedgy thing. right? First, let me say, wedges are freaking awesome. Inclined plane for the win. So, so this piece of molding is stuck in this frame, and the wedge acts as a clamp driven under the dowel. Just with finger pressure, it'll hold it tight. That clamps the edge of the molding upside down, pushed up against the side of the frame, and lets you take a block plane and smooth this down. And that, in turn, lets you get here. Right? So precision and control. Right? I'm not going to say you can't do this with power tools. I certainly can't do it with the power tools that I have and, and have no real interest to. Right? Absolutely amazing how precise you can get. You also have the flexibility to make anything. Like a lot of times people say, oh, you work by hand? What, ha you know, what can you not make? There's nothing you can't make. Everything prior to 1800 was made entirely by hand. Look at the ceiling in here. That was made after 1800. It was not made with machines. Parts of it might have been, but not the whole thing. All right, you can make anything by hand. Here's a real concrete example. This is a power tool called a jointer. And what a jointer does is take a piece of wood that's rough on the sides, the faces, or the edges, and it flattens them out. So those two sections, called the table, are at slightly different heights, like a 32nd of an inch. And under that guard, right, that thing in the middle, called a pork chop, actually, because of the shape, right, that thing swings out of the way when you bring the wood over it, and there's a set of three or four blades in there spinning crazy fast, right? And you take the wood, and you slide it over this, and as it moves from the low table to the high table, it skims off, uh, you know, a section of the board and the tips of your fingers, if you're not careful. Um, when you're done getting one face flat, you flip it up against that fence on the back, and you get one edge flat. Okay? So this is pretty typical for a home shop. It's a six-inch wide jointer. It probably costs, I don't know, 600 bucks. And the day after you bring it home, you go to the lumber yard, and you find a beautiful eight-inch wide board. <laughs> I've never met someone who owned a jointer that wasn't smaller than the jointer they wish they bought. Right? And so you know what some people do? They cut the board in half and joint the two halves, and then they glue it back together. And then they save their pennies for years and say, oh my god, I'm going to get a big jointer. Right? This is a 16-inch jointer. It costs thousands of dollars, weighs a colossal amount, takes up a ton of space. It's like an aircraft carrier. <laughs> right? And you have to have a ton of space on either side to move wood across it. Right? I mean, you need like 32 feet to do that. And it's still not big enough. Here's why. The top of my bench needs to be flat. So I need a 24-inch jointer, and it's got to be 16 feet long. Alternatively, instead of you know, buying a $10,000 jointer and putting it in the garage, in, in my wife's spot, um, <laughs> I can buy a $300 hand jointer and spend 15 minutes and be done. 
Devin, this is the thing I needed your help with. How do you know when you're done? Here, step up for a sec. Grab the end of that. You know when you're done, when you pull eight feet of two, three thousandth of an inch thick shaving that you can see through off your bench, right? You can do anything with a hand tool. Does that mean that the power tools are not useful to have? Thank you, Devin. No, they, they might be, right? But they have a limit. There's always a limit, and it affects what you do. All right. I love hand tools because they connect me to my work. I've built a lot of stuff over my 25 years writing software and my five years doing woodworking. And um, one of the things that I am absolutely most proud of is this. It is not fancy. It's built out of pine. It's my son's bed. I made it for him when he was seven years old because he wanted a bed with a cave. And I got to say, there's, there's fewer things I'm prouder of as a father than the fact that I made his bed with my own two hands. All right. Last thing, this isn't really a reason why I use hand tools. <laughs> it's just an observation. It takes time and effort to learn, but not a ridiculous amount of time and not a ridiculous amount of effort. All right, well, so that was super interesting to me, anyway. <laughs> and you might be saying, Tim, you know, this is a closure conference, <laughs> right? So here comes the rock and analogy. I work with another material. It's a beautiful thing because it has known structure and properties. Unlike the material I worked with for 22 years of my career or so, where who knows what that pointer actually refers to, I have a material I can reason about, right? Persistent data structures. This is what they look like. I have a fundamental tool for operating on persistent data structures. We think there's a lot of different tools, there's really just one. It's the function presented to the persistent diff data structure from, from different angles, right? The same way that sharpening was a gateway skill for hand tools, syntax, semantics, like this takes some effort to pick up. It's not that hard. You know what's hard? Finding a good picture to go with the notion of a function. <laughs> I found a picture that I think is actually a photograph of the library of seek functions. Here it is. You use those functions to carve up your data. <laughs> and you have an environment, right? You have this place that you work, this beautiful, clean, simple place that holds on to the stuff that you're doing. Like my workbench, it's based on something old. And here it is. And as with hand tool woodworking, Take some time and effort to learn. Totally worth it. Now you might say, Tim, I see what you did there. You repeated the material, the tools, and the environment in an attempt to convince me that these are really analogous in the same thing, and I'm not sure I believe it. So I'm going to do the thing you're not supposed to do, and I'm going to appeal to authority to convince you. And when you see who the authority is, you will be convinced. Roy Underhill again says, it's much like when Obi-Wan Kenobi <laughs> gave Luke Skywalker his lightsaber, right? Woodworking is like being a Jedi Knight with a lightsaber. <laughs> and of course, being a Jedi Knight with a lightsaber is a lot like being a Lisp programmer, <laughs> right? You can't argue with Obi-Wan Kenobi. <laughs> All right, so I assert that those two topics are now connected. Everyone comes along next, woodworkers and programmers, and says, you know, that's great, but I really want some automated power tools to, like, get me more productive. That's really what I need. And, you know, I have to be very careful here, and I, I'll just say right now, I am not against the notion of automation, right? Not by any means. I use a bandsaw, I use a drill press, I use a bunch of other things. I'm not against automation. But it's really important to understand that automation, when you automate something, it has an effect on how you perceive that thing. In the scholarship of automation, there's a thing called the substitution myth. The myth is that you can take a manual process and substitute an automated step and that it doesn't change. I think of it sort of as like the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, right? That the act of observing changes what's observed. 
Or more vividly, it's not until you look at them through a magnifying glass that you realize how often ants burst into flame. <laughs> so, the problem is, when you automate something, you change the nature of the thing. And you have to be aware of that, right? So there, so there, are, some, um, there are some great examples and some really uh, tragic examples. So I've got a couple down here. The first one's navigation. Studies show that when people use GPS navigation, they are far less aware of where they have been on their way to a destination. They're going to need the GPS to get back. I was talking to my friend uh, Russ, and he had a great story about this. He used to work at a company where there was a, a, a young guy who said, oh, I'm, I'm going to head out and see a friend in Pennsylvania this weekend. And Russ grew up in Pennsylvania, so he said, oh, where, uh, where are you going to go? And the guy said, I'm going to go wherever the GPS takes me. <laughs> so somewhere we crossed into this, like, I don't actually need to know where I am, which is a, an astonishing thing, and you better hope you have a good battery. Um, <laughs> the, the tragic one is uh, flight, right? There have been um, a lot of, the, there have been uh, various plane accidents in recent years where the conclusion about what the issue is, is planes that have been on autopilot coming out, off of autopilot in inclement weather and pilots reacting wrong because they don't spend enough time actually flying planes, right? They spend time monitoring the autopilot that is flying the plane. So the problem, really, the second bullet is the key, right? Knowing comes from doing. If you stop doing, ultimately you stop knowing, right? And that's where the fundamental cost is uh, in automation. So let's see where this affected things. We're going to start on the furniture side, but we'll talk about software too. Um, in, in the world of furniture, right, in the mid-1800s, machine tools started to really come into vogue. And of course, there's a huge benefit to them. You can produce more stuff faster and more economically. It's beneficial to everyone, right? It allowed for the creation of furniture that more people could afford as opposed to just, you know, the, the half of 1% or whoever. Um, it did, it's worth noting, change the furniture that we actually made. Every one of you in your house, I would bet, has a door like this. It's a cabinet door. And the, it has this joint up at the top that's called a stub tenon. The door that I had on the first slide way back when um, had a full mortise and tenon, meaning the rail on the top of the door has a tenon, which is a tongue, and it slides into the mortise, which is a hole in the upright piece. Right? It's completely contained and it goes almost all the way to the end. So that's a tremendous amount of glue surface for strength, and you can't see anything but two boards meeting at the top. So aesthetically, it's preferable. Those doors are extremely hard to find on commercial furniture today because they're more difficult to make. Instead, you find doors like this, a stub tenon. That, that little bit is all that's holding that door together. Right? It doesn't go any deeper than that, and it shows on the top. There's no aesthetic reason to do this. There's no structural strength reason to do this. It's 100% economical because you can make them uh, with a single pass on a rotary cutter like this, right? the grooves. In fact, here's a guy working on a machine that uh, makes a door in one minute and 37 seconds. He takes a piece of wood and pushes it in between those two pieces and it clamps down and he presses a button and the whole thing slides sideways and it comes back and he takes that piece of wood out and he puts another one in and does the same thing over and over and over and over again. Somewhat ironically, perhaps adding insult to injury for this gentleman, that machine is called the Unique 250. <laughs> I'm not entirely sure why. All right. So uh, machines changed what we made. But more interestingly, they changed how we make them. Right? Prior to the arrival of machines, like with machine tools, um, we tend to do things in terms of measurement. Right? So here's an example. This is a table saw. And you'll see right across the bottom, there's, there's this movable fence that moves a distance from the blade. That's that spinning physics wheel of death there. And uh, here's the ruler down here for setting the fence. Right? And so, what you would typically do is know, I want a piece that's five inches wide, so I move the fence over and I lock it down and I slide pieces past there. Right? So you do spend a bunch of time on machine setup and then you run a bunch of pieces. And from a productivity perspective, that's great. You, know, you run a thousand of them, however many you need. Okay? And so most of the time when we work this way, we work in terms of measurements. And so this is a cut list, which is all of the pieces that you would need, in this case, to build a particular shake or blanket chest. 
right? We need front pieces and side pieces, and here are the dimensions they should be, and really precise, right? This should be 9 16 of an inch wide, right? And you take those instructions over to your power tools, and you move all these levers with the rulers, and off you go. This is not how we used to do it. This is a woodworker, a picture of a woodworker named uh, Chris Schwartz, who's been um, really instrumental in bringing back a lot of hand tool techniques. And he's using a tool called a sector. You can't get sectors anymore, you gotta make them. It's basically these two pieces of wood hinged at the bottom, and periodically, at equal distance, up each of them is a mark and a number. So they're just measured off in some increments, right? In this particular case, what he's doing is taking this case piece and he's trying to figure out how many boards he needs to go across the back. And he wants to have six, and he wants them to be evenly sized. So he takes his sector and he spreads it out so that the 12 at the end, the mark 12, is put down in the back two corners of the board. Then he comes down to the mark two, which is one sixth of 12, and he sets a pair of dividers to two. And if he takes those dividers and steps off across that case, it's gonna come out exactly at six. He's just using geometry instead of arithmetic, right? The sector is a set of congruent triangles, right? And they're with predefined ratios. So he gets to exactly one sixth of however wide the case is. He doesn't ever have to know. He'll use those dividers, he'll mark off the piece of wood, he'll plane down to the line, they'll be the right size. Neither he nor anyone else will ever know how wide they actually are. Right? We used to work entirely in terms of proportion. This is a uh, page taken from the Chippendales director. That would be the original Chippendales director. <laughs> Again, published in the 1700s, and this was essentially the catalog of furniture that you might wish to acquire for your estate if you were landed gentry, because let's face it, the stuff was expensive. Um, the thing that's interesting about this is, this is basically the blueprint, and what do you not see on it? Any dimensions, any dimensions, right? There's a little bit over here, maybe a scale that shows some relative stuff, but there's no dimensions on it. And yet someone could take this and make one of these things. And how could they do that without their cut list? The answer is they based it on proportion. And so you could actually come in and say, I want one, you know, this wide. I have this wall, come, come see this wall and put a piece of wood up here and mark it and make me one that wide. And they would scale everything. It was like SVG, it was the original responsive design, <laughs> right? That's what they did. And how did they know how to make all the relative proportions? There was a whole scheme based on the classic orders of architecture, right? This is the ionic order, it tells you over here, it shows you the proportion, everything in terms of the width of a column. If you know the width of the column, you know everything else. Even at the tippy top, which isn't shown there, it's shown here, it's all proportional to the width of the column. And this was general knowledge to the people doing the work. Why was the classic order of architecture so important? Well, because the notion of beauty in Western culture is really tied up in the notion of proportion, right? Rich actually mentioned this last night with Harmonicate talking about, you know, the full steps. I don't know a lot about music, so I'm gonna start using words wrong here, right? But he said, you know, we're not going any half steps because that's like crazy noise. We want nice sounding stuff. And, you know, harmonics, I believe, are whole number ratios, right? In fact, there's a phrase, um, architecture is frozen music, and that's what it comes from. There's a less used phrase that described Donald Swan's music as defrosted architecture. <laughs> it actually all comes from here, right? The, uh, in, you know, ancient cultures saw the relative proportions of the human body as the essence of beauty. Right? The fact that the human body, by and large, is, is proportional. And so what we gained by automation of making this furniture was a tremendous amount of productivity and economic benefit that made furniture available for lots and lots of people. What we lost was working in a way that corresponded with several thousand years of construction practice driven by the most basic notions of what's beautiful. Now, if you go to a museum that has antique furniture, most of it comes from the period before when we switched over to automated machines. Now, maybe that's just because it's old. Maybe it's because they used up all the Honduran mahogany, bastards, right? <laughs> uh, but maybe it's because it is actually better. That doesn't mean that doing the automation is not good, right? It just means that there was a price. 
The good news is that with the help of the internet, um, there's a lot of work being done in the space. And so for people who are interested, there's now more and more material becoming available. Um, I like to think of it as, you know, to paraphrase uh, Justin Timberlake, we're bringing sectors back. <laughs> All right, so that's enough about furniture. What about in software development, right? Here too, the same thing happens. So I was working on a project one day and one of the project managers at my company came over and said, um, it would be really great this afternoon if you could go help this guy. I'm not using names to protect the guilty. And, uh, and I said, yeah, what's up? And, and, and she said, um, he's, been, he's been trying to build this test and he's been really struggling with it. He's been working on it for like most of the day and he says it's untestable. It's like, untestable, okay. Well, that sounds challenging, you know. I'll get a cup of coffee and I'll go see him and sit down and talk and say, all right, what is this thing that's untestable? Like, what's it do? It's so challenging. It makes an HTTP request. It makes an HTTP request. What's hard about testing that? I can't figure out the right way to express it in Cucumber. <laughs> it's not that it's untestable. It's that I don't know how to write the test in the test tool that I use. So eight minutes later, we had another test that didn't use that test tool, but ran as part of the automated test process and tested it. It's a fascinating thing, right? I think David said this before, the tools that you use shape how you look at the world. So for him, a test was like, it's got to be in Cucumber, right? That's not a requirement of anything in the project, but that's how he looked at the world. In fact, it's interesting along testing lines, how often do you say to a fellow developer, hey, does it work? Will the test pass? <laughs> yeah, that's not really the same thing. Deployment is another great example. I said, like, I'm, I'm 44, I've been doing this 25 years now, and I remember when you didn't have a network to deploy with, and I remember when you had a network, but drizzling binaries across it would be so damn slow, right, you carried it over there. But, but you know, stuff has really changed here. I was working on another project with a guy, and we had a deployment system that assumed that, you know, all you needed to carry to the machine was the name of a Git repo. And then you could get its contents, and you can find out its dependencies, and you get all its dependencies. Right? And you know where that doesn't work? In a secure lab where machines, by default, don't have outbound access to the internet. And the interesting thing was not that, it was that it really ticked him off. <laughs> it was crazy to him. It was gonna take more than a day for the people to wire up the special pipe so our stuff could install. He was like, this is outrageous. Why is there not just ubiquitous internet connectivity? Why would you want a secure machine not connected to anything? I, I think we have a better sense of the answer to that question now. <laughs> so this is, again, a real perception change, right? Like if someone said, you have to install your system, on, uh, you have to go install your software in a box that's not plugged into anything, what would you do? Do your tools allow it? Do they make it easy? Does everyone on your team know how to do it? Right? Again, perception change as we automated something. Development environments is another huge one. Um, I spent many, many years, I'm not ashamed to say, uh, working, I'm a little ashamed to say, working in the Microsoft environment. And it's, it's interesting, right? Visual Studio, the Microsoft IDE, uh, for people who embrace it, is you know, quite a productive environment. But it's an astonishing thing. Um, one of the things that happened with Visual Studio is that the, the developer base for Microsoft, they really have gotten to the point of feeling like this is... This is the only place stuff can come from, right? If it's not in Visual Studio, it doesn't exist. There is essentially no open source world in the .NET space to speak of. I mean, there are projects, certainly, right? But there's not broad adoption by developers because if it's not in Visual Studio, it doesn't exist. Here's the crazy thing, though. It affects the Microsoft product teams, too. If you make some cool new tech, but you can't figure out how to get in Visual Studio, it doesn't exist, right? You won't get adoption. I know it's hard to imagine, because working on the closure side, we don't know at all what it's like to be married to a particular environment where everything has to just be a key click away. Um, <laughs> now, Jennifer, earlier, I guess yesterday, did something very brave. She put Woosdal on the screen. <laughs> right? And Woosdal's an amazing thing. And she said, it wasn't meant for people to write. Well, I got news for you. It wasn't meant for people to read, either. 
I love this cartoon. Where did Wuzdal actually come from? I'm going to jump back in the Wayback Machine for a second, but soap. I, we're going to, going to throw out all the dirty laundry here, right? I, so the soap spec was written by three companies, Microsoft, Developmentor, and Userland. I worked at Developmentor at that time. The motivation for doing soap originally was that uh, Microsoft had DCOM in their RPC mechanism, which was not internet port friendly. It was very promiscuous with ports. And so people instead were using the web server IIS to drive content through port 80. And that caused a lot of friction inside Microsoft because the guys who own the web server and the guys who own the middleware, they, right? So they, the, the middleware guys were like, well, we should do what they're doing. We should drive XML over port 80. And that's really what was the uh, you know, initial step towards SOAP. And the thing that uh, happened along the way, though, was it was really easy to say, I've got some objects in memory and I know how to write them out right, as SOAP messages, but I've got to consume SOAP messages coming from somewhere else, and so I need to generate some code that knows how to do that. We don't have a way to do that. And so there was all this talk in the community about, well, what should we do? Should there be a description language? It's taken a really long time. And so literally, uh, a couple people took Wuzdal, which was the internal dispatch model for a particular SOAP toolkit, and said, this is what we should use. Right? And they put it out in the world. But, you know, the back of their mind, and this is the insidious thing about it, once, as a product team, you understand that my engineers will only ever use the IDE, it frees you to do crazy complicated things under the idea that the development environment is always going to protect you or protect them, depending how you look at it. Right? So I got news for you. Perhaps, perhaps bad news. This is going to be the first con where Wuzdal hits the screen twice. <laughs> but you saw, you know, and Jen, Jennifer's Wuzdal was so much nicer. So I generated this using uh, the first version of Windows Communication Foundation. It was hard to fit on a slide. You might have trouble reading that. <laughs> this describes a service with one endpoint. <laughs> and do you know what the endpoint does? It echoes. <laughs> and look, there it is. This says, you're going to send an echo request in, you're going to get an echo response out. And I know what you're thinking. Well, that's cool. I want to know what the echo request and response look like as messages. Um, that, that's actually defined in other files. <laughs> right? Here's the thing, though. Our industry went and did this to us as engineers, right? And we let them. Because we used a tool and had the thought that it doesn't matter. The tool's going to take care of us. Right? And we spent, I don't know, I worked in the soap space for most of 10 years. I think of it now, it was like a, it's like a giant train wreck, and it's one of those long, long Wyoming coal trains. It's like four miles long. And there's a train wreck down here, and at the other end, there's a factory making train cars. <laughs> I don't know when this thing is done. All right. So, so just a couple more quick examples. The entire stack, this floored me. I worked on a project recently for a customer doing a proof of concept, and we delivered this thing. It took us like eight weeks. It wrote a reasonable amount of data to the database like a, at, a, at a pretty high rate of speed, and it analyzed it all on the fly and presented it. And we demoed it for them, and the business loved it, and they had to sort of review the architecture and what did they really want to do. And one of the pieces of feedback that came back to us via back channels was there were people in the... Uh, in the organization who didn't understand how it could do this, right? Because, it, it, you know, because we were using esoteric things like, like um, cues. And, um, <laughs> and they didn't understand how they could do it, but in, this was the astonishing part to me. Instead of saying, wow, that's really interesting tech, how did you guys do that? Like, we had a couple sit-downs with people, we offered more. And ultimately, some of the feedback from people was like, we don't think it's real. And it's an amazing thing to me. Can you look at your tools and go, I so believe that this is the way, that if someone does something I don't know how to do with these tools, then they're making it up. <laughs> it's amazing. The last example I have is a really explicit example of changing um, how you look at the world. It's the notion of software factories. I don't know, how many of you know that term? It was blessedly short-lived. The idea was that some expert would configure a tool like Eclipse or Visual Studio to make apps a certain way because it was right. Um, and that your job would be to work the object stamper on the third ship next week. 
Um, so that kind of went away. But it has sort of another form. I, one thing that you can't help but notice, and I'm sure all of you have had this question when you, when you talked about Clojure at work, someone's like, what's the killer app? You know, going back, no one used to say, well, what's the killer app of C++? And the thing about killer apps is, once you start using a tool that builds killer apps, you start to think that every problem, right, is that killer app's the perfect solution. Killer apps are like, hey, man, this is the perfect way to build this thing, and now every problem I see is that one. Right? There are a lot of examples of that. I mean, it's funny, because we say, well, hey, when all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail, and it's totally true. No, or a chisel. All right, so this begs the interesting question. You know, automation, I, again, I'm going to repeat, I am not against automation. Automation provides productivity benefits, full stop, no doubt. But automation also changes our perspective of the problem, the world we're working in, and how we attack what it is we're trying to do. So while there's a lot of benefit if we're doing the same thing over and over again, I think it's interesting to ask the question, what happens if you want to make something unique? How do you use automated tools to make something unique? You don't. You go back to simple hand tools. So here are two examples. Artisans, right? And programmers love this analogy in general, right? I want to think of what I do as artisanal, right? I want to create things that are useful but also pleasing. And if that means it takes an extra couple of years. It's uh, <laughs> better, right? I, we don't want these machines to influence what we do. We're willing to use the machines for the rough stuff, but by and large, we want to like, really craft this. A great example of a guy who had this opinion is James Credoff, who is certainly in the running for uh, the most important American furniture maker in the last 50 years. He was really upfront about the fact that he was never going to compromise on his art. He built pieces like this. The thing was, though, he knew that what he was doing was not about productivity and not even about economic viability. I love that he wrote a book called The Impractical Cabinet Maker. <laughs> Let's be honest, right? And he ended up starting a school to actually support himself for at least a significant portion of his career. So I, I think that um, a lot of times we talk about artisanship and, and um, People talk about guilds and apprenticeship and all this stuff, and it's a very romanticized vision of what that means. The romance starts with, but I get to keep my salary, right? Um, so I, I actually think this is the wrong example, but I do think there's a very particular artisan that we're like. And these are the pattern makers. If you're going to get productivity with machines, you have to be able to build the machines. You got to start somewhere. So even with the rise of machines, there was a branch of woodworking called pattern making. What the pattern makers did was create wooden models of the parts that went in the machine. And the models were used to make the molds into which molten metal was poured to cast. So these guys were super skilled, super high value, tons of leverage off what they did because it enabled the machines to happen, right? So you look at that, it looks actually like a bit of rusty iron. It's actually wood. So is that one and that one, right? These are handmade models of gears that are going to drive the machines that drive everything else. Now, you're looking at this going, yeah, Tim, that's great. They make round gears. No, no. They make straight gears, too. <laughs> you know what else they make? Small engines. Yeah. This is actually a pretty modern one. That's a wooden model for a pump. Wood is still, in many cases, the best material for delivering to a forge to make a mold. This will ultimately, ultimately be replaced by stuff that gets 3D printed. But today, this is still state of the art. This one's not done entirely by hand. It was done with a computer-controlled router. But all of the finishing and you know, smoothing everything out and the rest of it is by hand. Right? So this is not you know, going to continue forever, but this is the way that it has been done for the last 100 years. I think that's who we are. Right? I think we are software pattern makers. We create the unique parts that allow the software machines that power our businesses or our organizations or whatever else we do. Right? And ultimately, this is what brings me back to closure and closes the loop on this hand tool metaphor. Right? I want tools that enable me to do unique things, that don't change my perspective or don't you know, <laughs> change my perspective without adding significant value. And I believe Clojure is a perfect tool set for doing this.
So now this begs a question. There's another reason that we automate stuff, not just productivity. We automate for convenience, too. The closure development environment, or a closure development environment, existed the day that closure shipped. Rich gave us the REPL and the compiler, and we used stuff from the Java ecosystem, right? We used Maven, we used JAR, we used what have you. Lots of you started back then, right? There were a lot of rough edges, you know, there was a lot of extra things to do. Um, and a lot of work has been done since then to automate pieces of that and make it far easier. And that is a good thing, right? Because it helps drive adoption. I work at Cognitech. I certainly want adoption of the closure stack, right? It's made it uh, easier for people to get started. Um, but like all automation, there's a cost somewhere. Now, I'm not going to claim that I know what the cost is. I have on the next slide a proposal for what the cost might be. But I think this question is really worth thinking about. So here's what I think it might be. If you go into a line again project file and add a line, right, add a new dependency, line again will fetch that the next time it's needed because you're starting a REPL or what have you, and it'll tell you, right? You can always run a command line and have line again tell you exactly what it is you depend on. But you're going to see it that first time when it comes down, right? You're going to kick off a REPL. That stuff's mostly hidden now. You don't see a class path anymore. You might ultimately generate a jar, right? And the mechanics of that are, are, you know, it's just taken care of for you. The files that are downloaded are no longer in a lib directory in your project. They're off in your Maven repo. So increasingly, the things that we saw as like, hey, these are all the things I use to do what I do, there's fewer and fewer signs of them, right, in your face from the environment you're working in. Again, you can get them, right? You can run line depths tree. You can generate a jar and look inside it. The question is, do you? And if you don't, the further question is, do you actually know what you ship? And the further question beyond that is, should you know what you ship? I'm pretty sure about the answer to the last one. <laughs> Again, I'm not saying this is you know, happening in the world. I just think it's worth looking at all of the things. Like We've had great talks this week. A lot of people talking about, hey, I've got this great thing. It automates this. It's fantastic for this reason or the other. And I don't mean to sound like a wet blanket, but there's always that other question which is, how does it change how I look at the world, right? I've said a couple times, I spent a long time working in the OO world and stacking all kinds of stuff on top of it, aspect-oriented, all kinds of uh, uh, class libraries and object models and uh, IOC, the injection of complexity and all that stuff. <laughs> and, uh, and I will forever be grateful to Rich for giving us a tool set that is merciless, blah, 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 mercilessly and mercifully simple. It's merciless in its pursuit of simplicity, and in giving us that, it's merciful to us. So, you see the world through your tools. Simple tools give you a broader perspective. You can automate things, but the more you do it, the less clearly you see the world. So, be mindful when you automate, and know your tools. Thank you.